programs. These are all part of our national advantages and assets. So while maintaining our close ties with the US and the European Union, we are tapping into these other networks as never before. We are a transatlantic nation as well as a European one, but our role and interests go beyond that to be global. Now let's linger for a while in the Europe, European Union centre on our place in the EU. I always like to start with an historical context. The EU, like history itself, is a work in progress. You're all students of the EU, so I suspect I'll be covering familiar ground, but it's worth reflecting for a minute on how we got where we are today. Um, let me say a little bit about my own time in Brussels as part of that context. Now, Brussels uh, is a great city. If you've never been there, I, I thoroughly recommend it. It's rich in history, heritage, and culture. It's one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Sit at any restaurant and eavesdrop for a minute, and you will hear myriad accents and languages and international conversations galore. It may be the European center, but it's where the world meets too. <coughs> Now, I spent four happy years in Brussels, but I don't mind admitting that there were times when I wondered what I was doing there. The Brussels machine is characterized by many things, some of them none too flattering. But one that sticks in my mind is its ability to hold long and tedious meetings, many of them deep into the night. I have memories of sitting in rooms with 26 other member state delegates, the European Commission, the Council Secretariat, the Presidency Delegation, interpreters, and building staff who would deliver the world's worst coffee, believe me. <laughs> Ironic in Brussels. Sitting through this at 2 a.m. discussing the 14th draft of the Bus Manufacturer Harmonisation Directive is not always my idea of fun. <laughs> I especially remember a particularly late, late night when the Italian delegate was speaking, and I do apologise if there are Italians in the room, but I what comes next is by way of, way of illustration, not, uh, not, not condemnation. And I was listening to the English interpretation through my headphones when the interpreter stopped interpreting while the Italian continued to talk. After a while, those of us listening to the English interpretation turned to the English interpreter in her booth with quizzical looks on our faces. Spotting the anxiety among us, she took the microphone again and said for our benefit, I'm still waiting for the verb, I'm sorry. <laughs> this brought a little laughter to an otherwise testing and testy meeting. It didn't delay the whole pain of the meeting and we pressed on doggedly to the end, concluding that we would resume later that day on the 15th draft. Now there is a serious point about this. Despite the tedium, the detail and the late nights, this is, this is the way European countries do business with each other now. They thrash out agreements, put aside their differences. It might take 15 drafts, but I'd rather be part of an organisation that agreed on the 15th draft and gave up on the first. And it's not so many years ago that some of the member states were shooting at each other. That's not how we resolve our differences anymore. And not so long ago, many of our members were stuck behind an iron curtain with no freedom and scant chance of prosperity. That's the historical context. I was discussing with Natalie in advance, and uh, she, I think, uh, dared me to mention the peace historical context within the first five minutes, but I think I've actually gone beyond five minutes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's a familiar yeah. thing. Look, the EU exists because Europe's history is not a happy one. In the last few centuries, we've spent too much time fighting each other. But now we can look back on close on 70 years of uninterrupted peace. There's the peace word, and it took me 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> we shouldn't take this for granted, and should see the EU in this light. The EU, with its origins in the European coal and steel community many years ago, is predicated on forging agreements, and I think that gets forgotten. It doesn't always look like that, and to be honest, it doesn't always achieve it. But its member states recognise that the EU is at its strongest when they all agree. And that's why we sit around at 2 a.m. thrashing out the drafts. I, I know from my own experience of four years in Brussels, which I hadn't realised the day I arrived in Brussels, that everything is predicated to getting an agreement. That's how it's set up, and it's, and it's, a, it's a valuable thing that we, that we forget. 
Now my next sentence here says, but what do we, the UK, really think of the EU? And I think that may be a dangerous question, but let's, let's see where this goes. Now look, we've been accused of being ambivalent about Europe. We're part of it, but we don't really belong in it. Late arrivals to the European Party, we see ourselves as separate, both geographically and psychologically. I can't deny that we have shown traces of the little Englander. They surface in some of our tabloid newspapers, sometimes in offensively xenophobic language, and it's not something I, as a Briton, uh, uh, can be very proud about. The view is we don't like straight bananas and don't like being told by Brussels that we have to have them. We don't like being told that our chocolate isn't really chocolate. And we don't like all that metric measurement stuff. In short, we don't like being told what to do by foreigners. As the joke has it in a fictional weather report, fog in English Channel, continent cut off. At least this is the impression that you might have if you read some of our newspapers. But as ever, as ever the reality is different. Even during the, the Thatcherite years, when our European policy was caricatured as Mrs. Thatcher wielding her handbag, obstructing all progress in Europe, we were helping to shape the future of Europe. It was Mrs. Thatcher's government who drove the creation of the single market, opening up Europe as a market of then 320 million people and now more than 500 million people. It was Mrs. Thatcher who signed the Single European Act for Britain, putting the single market in place. She fought hard for British interests and in so doing she helped shape the future of Europe, stemming the flow of enthusiasm for a federal Europe and reasserting the vision of Europe as a community of sovereign states and not a super state. Britain has always argued for a bigger EU. Enlargement is, and always has been, a key plank of our EU policy. <coughs> the last major enlargement of the EU in 2004 brought in 10 countries, most of them from the former Eastern European bloc. What an extraordinary time that was. The Berlin Wall had been torn down barely 15 years earlier. The peoples of East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and the Baltic states shared the values and aspirations of their Western neighbours and demanded the same democratic and political freedoms. Tearing down the Berlin Wall was only part of the story. The rest was about those countries aspiring to and meeting the standards of the rule of law and human rights, things that they had been denied for most of the 20th century. Membership of the EU was an extraordinary incentive for those countries to transform almost everything about themselves, their society, their culture, their economy, uh, their external relations. Enlargement remains a major part of the EU agenda and of Britain's agenda in the EU. We've got eight more countries in line to join and Britain supports their ambitions. We are unequivocal in our support for all the countries uh, who, uh, who are in line to join. For us it is a vital strategic goal. Shared security and prosperity built on a firm foundation of democracy and the rule of law. We want to see the Western Balkans back in Europe, extending stability and success to a part of the world where conflict is still an all too recent memory. The British government believes it would be a profound mistake to let the momentum, momentum of enlargement stall in a changing world whose economic and political weight is swinging eastwards. The European Union will remain strong only if it is outward looking and continues to grow. That's why we in Britain are strong supporters of the EU neighbourhood policy and believe that membership of the EU should be open for any European country that wants to join and can meet the rigorous accession criteria. Of those eight countries standing in the winds, Croatia and Iceland are well on track to be the next ones to join, and the UK looks forward to welcoming, welcoming them as member states in the near future. Indeed, I hope it will be one of the pleasures of my next job in Reykjavik to be there when Iceland becomes a member. The British vision is of a dynamic, outward-looking Europe. Some say that we should pause after Croatia and that we only want the EU to be enlarged so that it becomes unwieldy and impossible to function. 
These are false propositions which the British government rejects. A bold enlargement program plays to Europe's strengths through the entrenchment of stability and democracy, the single market, the free movement of workers, the collective approach towards developing a low carbon economy. These great successes of the European Union are founded upon the principle that together the countries of Europe are greater than the sum of our parts. The British government believes that principle still stands. Of course, the workings of the European Union can be improved, and we are determined to be actively engaged in doing so. But halting the momentum of enlargement is absolutely not the solution to Europe's problems, and neither would it help with our neighbourhood policy. With enlargement comes a greater responsibility in our neighbourhood, which now stretches a very long way from London. The intervention in Libya, for example, is a powerful example of where Europe showed its international stand standing. We're stronger together and can exert real influence. Most recently, the EU has been leading the charge on Iran with a tr twin track approach of pressure and engagement. It's exactly this type of unity and solidarity that we should bring to bear when dealing with international challenges, using the combined effort of the EU and working closely with member states to achieve our objectives. Now, I've mentioned uh, the single market once or twice. This is, this is part of the bedrock of which the EU is now founded. A market of 500 million people is a phenomenal economic power. And for the UK, it brings major benefits. It adds 600 billion euro a year to our economy. Seven out of, ten, seven out of our top 10 trading partners are European. We are the EU's gateway for global investors. 26% of non-EU companies have their headquarters in the UK. UK foreign direct investment is £482 billion for the EU, while the EU figure is £351 billion worth of investment in the UK. But we're, we're not complacent about the EU's economic place in the world. If current trends continue by the middle of the century, Leading EU nations could fall out of the world's top 10 most powerful economies. The EU will need to reform, which comes in a number of guises. We need to ensure that the EU continues to have a strong global financial services centre. Yes, we think that means London, but London's strength is the EU's resilience, especially in light of the lessons of 2008. The emphasis in the EU must be on economic growth based on four principles. Extending the single market, promoting free trade, reducing red tape, and encouraging innovation. These are all fundamentally British aims, which are shared by the European Commission, I think, and other member states. Now, I hear you mutter, what about the Eurozone? There are two aspects of the Eurozone that I want to consider. First, <coughs> What does the current crisis say about the UK's position in Europe? And second, what do we think should happen? Now, an obvious statement to begin with, the UK is not part of the Eurozone. I'm sure to you as students of the EU, that's obvious. But I do find it needs to be repeated in some circles. We never have been, and we have no plans to be members of the Eurozone. But we have a major stake in its success. We have no interest in seeing the collapse of the Eurozone.